probably known to, to some of you. Um, Coral is the uh, Marine Education Officer um, who works at uh, the Wembury Marine Centre uh, and has done, I believe, for seven years. Uh, she's a, a graduate of Plymouth University where she studied marine biology and oceanography uh, and then did a master's in biological diversity. And she's worked with a, a variety of uh, different organisations, initially on a volunteer basis with the WT and also the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and also National Trust. Um, but uh, then she worked with the education team for the Marine Biological Association of the UK before moving on to become the Marine Education Officer and, and working in education with the Wildlife Trust. So uh, she's come to talk to us to, tonight about uh, what goes on at Wembury and about Marine Conservation Trusts and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a, a fascinating evening. So Coral, if I may hand over to you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just share my screen. And uh, hopefully, yeah. okay. can you see that, Simon, okay? Yeah, that's good. That's come oh, yeah. up, that's grand. Okay, so yeah, thank you uh, very much for that introduction. And thanks very much to Bobby Tracy Local Group for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, so yeah, as Simon said, I've, I'm the Marine Education Officer for Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, I've been based at, at Wembury Marine Centre for the past uh, seven years now. So tonight I'm going to talk about the marine conservation area, what makes it special. So the, the amazing marine life that we get there. I've tried to um, select my favourites, although I could probably go on for hours, but I've tried to, to narrow them down a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about those. I'll talk about the work that, that we've been doing at the Marine Centre for the past, um, well, for the past seven years I've been there, but the, the centre's been open for the past 25 years. Um, and then a little bit about the, the past year, obviously COVID, all the things that have happened and what our plans are for the future. And um, as Simon said, there'll be time for questions at the end. So um, if I was doing this talk in person, I'd be asking all of you how many of you have been to Wembury Beach before. Um, hopefully some of you have. Um, and it just, it really is a, a really special place. So it's, it's highly regarded as one of the, the best places to rock ball in the region, if not the whole country. The, the history of the research which has taken place at Wembury and, and all of the um, achievements which which have which have taken place there are just phenomenal so it really is a special place uh, I feel very lucky to work there and um, so I'm just going to sort of run through the the amazing diversity of marine life that we get there and um, that, that I try to share with with visitors and people and school children which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about a bit later so obviously when when we talk about the marine environment or we try to raise awareness of the marine environment and marine conservation it can be tricky even though uh, we've got two coastlines in Devon but most of the time you know when we're down at the beach this is what we see unless we're really interested um, in exploring more this is the view that most people get so it is quite difficult to explain to people just how amazing that marine life is it's not quite the same as um you know perhaps visiting our nature reserves or just seeing you know seeing greenery when we drive and we walk around so it's it's a slightly different type of role, I suppose. Um, one of the things I, I find amazing and that I learned since being at DWT is that over half of our wildlife lives in the sea. And I just think that's, that's phenomenal. And we need to, um, you know, we really need to raise awareness of this and we really need to look after it. So a lot of the images I'm gonna show you tonight are from um, my good friend, Paul Naylor, who's very generously lets us use his amazing photography for lots of our education work. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy these, these images whilst I talk through them. So starting off with seaweed or algae, I think that very often gets overlooked, um, but it is, it's highly important. It's incredibly beautiful. If you've ever been um, snorkeling in South Devon, the, the, the seaweed absolutely brings the underwater world to life. Um, and I just think it's amazing that the benefits that we get from it as humans, as well as, as the amazing diversity. So at Wembury, we get over 100 different species of seaweed, which again, you know, I think is amazing considering it's a relatively, um, a relatively small area. It's quite, quite a big rocky shore, but the, the diversity of, of algae and seaweeds is amazing. Um, so seaweed's usually classified into to three different colours, three different groups. So we have the reds, the browns and the greens. 
So the, the green seaweeds usually occur um, where if there are streams that, that run onto the beach. So where there's quite a lot of nutrients coming down onto the beach, you tend to get these blooms of, of green algae like this gutweed. And then you have sea lettuce as well, which, um, which apparently is edible. Um, and certainly lots of the sea snails and other animals like to eat it as well. So we've got our green seaweeds. We've got our beautiful red seaweeds like this Irish moss or carrageenan. So if you enjoy ice cream or milkshakes or custard or jelly, then have a look on the ingredients list for carrageenan and that will be this stuff that's in it. It's, it's dried up and turned into a powder and it's used to thicken lots and lots of products. So it's used in, in a range of food products um, and it has lots of other uses for us as well. And the way to tell um, this, this species apart from others is that when the light shines on it, you can't see it in this picture here, but when the light, the sunlight shines on it, it has this amazing iridescent blue tips to it. Um, which, which really just bring it to life. And that's how you tell it apart from the other species. And then probably one of my favorite uh, seaweeds is this rainbow rack, which is actually classified as a brown seaweed. But as you can see, if the light hits it um, in the right way, it has this beautiful turquoise um, and green coloring to, to the fronds. And it's not very common rainbow rack. We have um, some of it at Wembury, we don't have as much as we used to. So it's one of those, things that you know when you stumble upon it usually snorkeling but sometimes rock falling it's it's a really wonderful find and you can get some some nice images like this and then of course down at the lower shore as we're heading down into into slightly deeper water subtidal we have our our kelp which is um, some of the, the tallest algae that we get in the UK so they create these huge amazing forests you can see here it's even got other seaweeds growing on it so the kelp's really, really important habitat and food um, and shelter for lots of the animals that, that live in the marine conservation area and all around our coastline. OK, so one of the, um, I think, one of the most sort of amazing animal groups are the Cnidarians. So Cnidarian comes from the Latin for, for stinging animals. So these are the corals and the anemones and the jellyfish. They're, they're purely aquatic and marine uh, organisms so there aren't any any terrestrial cnidarians um, and as you can see here the colour and the shape and the diversity is, is just absolutely amazing and so at Wembury these are quite a common find on on a rock pool or a snorkel safari these are snake locks and anemones they can be this colour this beautiful green with purple tips the the green is actually algae which the anemone holds inside its tentacles um, or sometimes they can be a, a purpley a uh, pinky sort of dullish brown colour, which don't have that, that algae inside them, but really lovely to find in, in sunlit rock pools. And this little, little thing here, I don't know if you'll have um, seen one of these before in, in real life. They're very, very difficult to, to find. They're only really a few centimetres long. These are called stalked jellies or stalked jellyfish. And uh, most cnidarians have either one of or two phases, um, one of two phases. So they are either a polyp, which is like a coral or an anemone, or they're a medusa, which is like a jellyfish. And this one actually has um, both phases, but it stays attached to things like seaweed, unlike um, the, the traditional sort of jellyfish, which floats in the water. So these tiny little amazing organisms, if you've got a really good eye, you can find them um, on, the, on the fronds of seaweed. And more often than not, you you end up uh, finding them by accident or just spotting them in a picture because they're, they're so well camouflaged and so, so difficult to spot, but really amazing um, little animals. And then of course the, the gorgeous jellyfish, this one here is the compass jelly. So these tend to come into the bay in the summer months um, with, with lots of other jellyfish once the plankton's bloomed, um, the jellyfish tend to bloom and then they, they wash in with the currents. These are one of the, the stinging jellyfish, so just um, be careful if you if you spot one of these while swimming in the summer. You don't need to, to be too scared of them, but they can give a bit of a sting, so just make sure you don't get, get too close. But as you can see from the picture here, the markings on their bell are just amazing, and, and obviously their name comes from those brown lines which look like the markings of a compass. And then out in uh, the deeper water, so around the Mewstone and, and out in the, the Mewstone ledges, the reefs that um, lots of the diving groups like to visit, 
we have this beautiful cold water coral, which is called pink sea fan. So like most corals, it's very slow growing, only grows about a centimetre a year. And you might, you might find their skeletons washed up. They're quite commonly washed up. They're sort of brown, look almost like mini trees. Um, so that's, that's their skeleton. And then these um, thousands of tiny little sort of pink coral polyps grow on that skeleton. Um, and they, the, the whole organism only grows about a centimetre a year. So very slow growing, very long lived. They can live for over 100 years. Uh, but very easily damaged as well, unfortunately. So big storms can rip them off the seabed and off the rocks and they can get entangled in uh, fishing line. So we find wash lots of them washed up on the beach, unfortunately tangled in that sort of very thin fishing line or angling line, which are called um, sea fangles. And there's a recording project where you can submit your records if you, if you find those. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to the mollusks. So this is the most um, diverse um, group of animals. I think there's something like 75,000 species of mollusks worldwide. So that includes obviously all of the, the terrestrial mollusks. Um, and as you can see in the marine environment, again, it's, it's really quite diverse. So we have <coughs> these little, um, little things here, which are called blue rayed limpets. Again, these are another really special little organism for those with a, a keen eye. They're only a really maximum of a centimetre long. So you, you have to ha get a piece of kelp um, and have a really good look for it. They're easier to spot when you're snorkeling rather than rock crawling. Um, and as you can see here, they've got these amazing sort of metallic turquoise dashed lines going, going back over their shells. So they spend their whole lives on a piece of kelp um, moving up towards the fronds in the summer month. And they just sort of graze on it, as you can see in the picture. And then in the winter, they move down the kelp towards the base where it's uh, more sheltered and because the, the kelp will shed its fronds um, and then regrow them again next year. So just amazing little animals, really. Um, one of my favourite sea snails uh, is this one here. This is a painted top shell. They're really, really beautiful shells. And you can see a really sort of tall cone shaped um, shell with these pink and purple stripes going all the way around. You tend to find these right down on the lower shore, um, sort of in crevices. Um, you can see in the picture here, this is quite zoomed in, that, that seaweed's quite small, but um, a really lovely, lovely sea snail to find and lovely shells, empty shells to, to find on the beach and collect one or two. Really nice. Oh, and that, that seaweed there is another favourite of mine as well, called string of sausages weed, which um, I think it's sort of, uh, does what it says on the tin really. Um, On to the um, sea slugs or nudibranchs which are another group of, of the mollusks. They don't have the obvious shell that lots of, um, lots of the, the mollusks do, so the sea snails and the snails we have on the land. This is the grey sea slug. This is fairly common at Wembury. We don't see as much now as, as we used to, um, but you, as you can see they're quite well camouflaged. I think these these sea slugs can actually um, consume the small little anemones that you get on the rocks and they can reproduce their sting, um, which I think is, is really amazing. Without, without getting stung themselves, they can synthesize those stinging cells and reproduce them in their own bodies so that nothing will want to eat them, which is just brilliant. And these are what their eggs look like. So if you go rock crawling, you, from time to time, you might find lots of different types of of jelly or blobby things. A lot of the time they're eggs. Grey sea slugs um, lay their eggs in this sort of ribbon shape and you, and you can see in there the, all the tiny little white dots. So there are thousands and thousands of eggs that they lay at a time in this sort of circular ribbon shape on the underside of rocks. So if you turn a rock over and you find some eggs, really important to make sure you, you put it back down into the water so they've got a good chance of, of survival. And another amazing um, little animal, this is the uh, solar powered sea slug, which um, I think it's, uh, it's, its common name went to a, a public vote and it came out with the solar powered sea slug, which is just really amazing. You can see on, the, on its body, those tiny little turquoise dots, they're chloroplasts, which the sea slug, um, Again, it synthesizes from eating algae and then it can reproduce those, those cells into its own body. 
um, and then basically sort of uh, get the, the products of photosynthesis photosynthesis it's really really amazing little sea slug and they can grow from sort of few millimeters long they can be really tiny um if if you've got a good eye to spot them then they can grow up to a, a few more centimeters probably maximum of about five centimeters and in, in this picture here it's got its sort of body curled up um, but sometimes it unfurls and it looks like um a really beautiful leaf so i'd normally if i was doing this talk in person i'd show a little film of this but um it probably won't work virtually so at the end i'll i'll put the link to our, our youtube page um where we've got some lovely videos that have been made um one of which is is this animal which is just fascinating and then probably one of the most unusual mollusks and most people wouldn't think they're mollusks um are the cephalopods so the the octopus the squid um and this one here which is probably um, you know, one of one of the most amazing um, marine animals that we get in Wembury Bay. Um, just just incredibly intelligent animals. You can see here. There's three in this picture. Um, their shape, their pattern, their colour can change in a, in a split second. I think um, research has shown now that they're even more intelligent than octopus. So the smartest invertebrate in the ocean. Absolutely amazing. They um, like to live in seagrass. So we have. Um, seagrass meadows around the, the mouth of the Yelm estuary which is just to the to the east of, of Wembury Bay so no doubt will there'll be some living there and, and South Devon is, is very um, popular for cuttlefish because we've still got quite a bit of seagrass left which is great so um, probably one of the most common things you'll find beachcombing are the cuttlefish bones which wash up like little white surfboards on the beach um, and although we call them bones they're actually the, the sort of internal shell so they do still have that shell um, being a mollusk but they they have it on the inside of their bodies rather than on the outside like the sea snails and then moving on to another amazing group of, of marine organisms are the echinoderms so these are the the starfish um, sea urchins brittle stars sea cucumbers so a kinoderm means spiny skinned. So it's all the animals that sort of fit that, that description. They all have a five, five sort of sided symmetry, um, echinoderms, although it's quite difficult to, to see that in the, in the sea cucumber, but it's, it's quite clear in the, in the starfish and the sea urchins. So they have sort of five equal parts um, of their body plan. And so one of the, <coughs> One of the favourites at Wembury is this little starfish here. Certainly when we do our schools rock balling, um, the children absolutely love to find these and we never get bored of finding them either. These are the cushion stars. So tiny little orange starfish, or they can sometimes be olive green. Um, I'm not sure why they're called cushion stars because they're not very soft, um, but they've got very cute little arms. Usually, usually five arms, sometimes um, they, they might have less if they've lost an arm. Sometimes they might grow two backs. You might find some with six arms sometimes. But they only get about the size of a 50 pence piece, so not very big. And you tend to find them on the underside of rocks. And one of my favourite facts to, to talk to children about the cushion stars, which really confuses them, is that when they're two years old, they all turn into boys. And when they're four years old, they all turn into girls. So it's slightly complicated to, for the little ones to get their head around, but quite a few uh, marine species do, do change sex depending on um, what's going on in their population and what's going on in the environment as well. So really interesting little, little starfish. And then this is probably my favourite, my favourite thing to find rock pulling or snorkelling is this, um, this starfish here, which is the spiny starfish. So this is the UK's biggest starfish. They can grow up to about 70 centimetres, although usually we find them quite a bit smaller. But as you can see in this picture, they're, they're still quite a big find for, for a rock pool safari. Um, we, we tend to find them around 20, 20 centimetres or so, which is just amazing. And you can see this beautiful sort of bluish colour. They've usually got purple tips on the end of each arm, which are little eye spots. And they get their name, obviously, from these white spines which run along their, their arms to protect themselves. Now, starfish, true starfish, have these 
um, sort of suckers, suction cups, which are called tube feet, which help them stick to things and help them move around um, and, and help pump water around their body. So instead of having a, a sort of blood um, cardiovascular system, they have a water vascular system, which is how they get oxygen around their body. <clears throat> and you can see around the, the white spines, they have tiny little other white structures, which are like little jaws, which stop things um, trying to settle on the starfish. So they, they almost attack things that land so that, that nothing can, can settle and, and bother them. <clears throat> and then a close, a close relative of the true starfish are the brittle stars. And again, their, their name sort of does what they, they say on the tin, very sort of spindly long arms. They can break off very easily. So we, we try not to, to pick these up if we find them rock pulling. Um, really fast compared to the, the normal sea stars, starfish. Um, so they can cover quite a bit of distance. They can be found on the rocky shore or in sandy areas. There's lots of different species of, of brittle stars. And again, the, the sort of coloration and pattern on them is, is brilliant. And then the sea urchins. So we don't get many species of sea urchin at Wembury. This is probably the main one we get, which is the green sea urchin. Only a few centimetres long. Um, these spines here, which, which protect themselves from things trying to eat them. You can see in this picture here, this one's managed to get some seaweed um, entwined in the, in the spines, which is really good for camouflaging it. So it's, it somehow manages to do this on purpose. Um, a, again making them well camouflaged so so things won't come and eat and then the crustaceans so <clears throat> probably what most people think about when they think about the rocky shore and going rock pooling is is looking for crabs and um, prawns and shrimps and and other things as well so the barnacles are one of the more unusual crustaceans because i don't think we think about barnacles as being crustaceans but perhaps more like the sea snails being a mollusk but they are in fact a crustacean and they, they start off as, as plankton and then eventually they settle on the rock and become um, the, the barnacles that we see them. A lot of the time they're not doing anything, but when they're under the water, they open up those little plates and they've got these sort of feathery legs, which they um, put out into the water to collect little bits of plankton and, and food to eat. So again, one of those things that doesn't look that interesting um, on first appearances, but really they have very exciting little lives. So another favourite to find rock pooling are the hermit crabs. At Wembury we have um, two, two quite common species now, which is great. So we have the common hermit crab, which has always been there. Um, and then the St Piran's hermit crab, which um, disappeared from Wembury in, in the 1980s. And there have been various reasons sort of put forward as, as to why they disappeared, whether it's to do with the population or whether it was to do with the, um, the, the Torrey Canyon oil spill which affected the, the dog whelks where they, which they like to use for their shells. Um, but about, probably about six or so years ago, we found the first one, one of our volunteers found the first one at Wembury for over 30 years, um, which was just brilliant. And now they're, they're really quite common. Um, so you can see in the picture, they've got the, the red legs, the red eye stalks with the black and white eyes. They're very shy compared to the common hermit crab. Um, but really, really beautiful little little hermit crabs. <clears throat> okay, so the edible crab, or the the gentlemen of the sea, as uh, they're affectionately known. This is probably my favourite crab. Um, we haven't we've noticed they they potentially declined at Wembury, so we haven't done any um, any official studies. But anecdotally, they they seem to um, not be as as numerous as they used to be. Um, this is the, the edible crab, so it's the one that's commercially um, fished and harvested for food. Um, they're also called the pasty crab or the pie crab, because their, their shell has little crimps in it, like a pasty shape. Um, and really, really strong claws, as you can see in the, in the picture. They have very, um, very powerful claws, so you definitely don't want to put your fingers anywhere near them. And then the, the largest uh, crab we have in, in Wembury Bay is the spiny spider crab. So these are pretty big, big guys. They have these long orange legs so they can move forwards, backwards, sideways, any direction, unlike most other crabs. Their shell is really, really hard with, with sharp spines. So they're really quite, um, 
quite difficult to pick up and can be quite painful. And these long um, pincers at the front, which again, can sort of reach around and nip you if you're not careful. So another one that we tend to just enjoy watching if, if we find it in the rock pools and we try not to bother them um, too much. And these spend probably the most, the longest amount of time decorating their shells. You can see this one here, it's completely covered in lots of different species of seaweed, including an invasive species. Um, so they will often spend lots of time collecting bits of seaweed and putting them into those spines to, to completely camouflage themselves, which is, which is really, really clever. And probably one of the, the most amazing things we found on, on a rock called safari quite high up the shore as well is this um, common lobster. I think he must have got caught out by the tide. Um, and ended up in a really shallow rock pool, but a really um, amazing crustacean. You can see these huge claws, beautiful blue shells. So the lobsters only go pinky orange when they've been cooked. Um, the, the common lobster is usually this gorgeous bluey colour, um, long red antennae. And um, occasionally we see small ones um, when, when rock falling. This is, this is the only one I've ever seen of this size in the rock pools, but we do sometimes, if we're lucky, just notice little red antennae poking out from a crevice in the rock pools. Mm -hmm. Okay, then on to the, the sort of last group I'm gonna talk about. Um, this is the chordate. So these are, these are our relatives, uh, which live in the sea. Again, a really um, sort of mixed group with some, some members, which you might find really quite surprising. So these, yeah, are our closest relatives. Chordates um, means, um, basically sort of having a backbone or a spine, spinal column, spinal cord. Um, and very unusually, these organisms here belong to that, to that group, to that phylum. And this is a type of sea squirt called a star ascidian. So it's a colony of sea squirts. And they belong to the chordate group because when they're, they're larvae, they have um, the sort of basis of, of a, what's called a notochord, and then they somehow settle onto the rocks and they, they absorb that, and then they become this amazing um, just sort of colony of, of organisms, which you can't quite get your head around the fact that these are animals um, and they are somehow sort of related to us. It's just, and they're, they're just beautiful. If you, if you turn over a rock and you see that, they look like beautiful petals. Um, and just a lovely thing to point out to people, just to show how sort of amazing and unique um, the marine environment is. That's just a bit of a close up of, of a small colony on a, a piece of kelp. And all these little things around the, the star ascidian are, are another colony of animals called bryozoans, which, um, which is one for another day. I love these, these individuals here. These are called light bulb sea squirts. You can see why they get their name. Um, these are a, a different type of sea squirt, so they, they sort of grow in, in groups, in clumps, um, attached to a rock um, down on the lower shore. Um, and again, just a lovely thing to sort of find. So moving on to the fish, um, to the vertebrates. One of the, uh, this is probably, you know, one of the things that really does make Wembury stand out um, compared to other places is, is this giant goby. So this is a very rare fish that can grow up to about 30 centimetres. Wembury is the furthest east um, that we know of that, that this um, species occurs in the UK. So it occurs from Wembury westwards down into Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, but, but doesn't occur anywhere else. So it's nationally very rare. Um, and as I said, it can grow up to 30 centimetres, which is absolutely massive for a rock pool fish. Um, so these are legally protected in the same way that um, bats are and, and great crested newts. So it's um, basically, it's an offence to, you know, intentionally damage or disturb them or their homes. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we don't use nets when we go rock pooling and we, we discourage people from using nets. They can catch these, these fish unintentionally, you know, of course, um, but they'd be quite difficult to catch without a net. So um, that we, we encourage rock pooling just using sort of hands and buckets, but we're hoping to do some monitoring in the next few years to, to find out how many we've got at Wembury um, and then to, to do a bit more awareness um, about, about their, you know, their living there and, and their conservation. Really lucky to have them. And then um, you might remember this 
picture, if you've seen any of Paul Naylor's talks, this is one of probably his most famous one and my, my favourite um, shallow reef fish. This is the corkwing wrasse. This is a, a beautiful male who has this amazing coloration. So just like um, in the bird world, it's usually the males that have these beautiful bright colours. It's the same with the fish. So the males want to attract the females. These guys make amazing um, nests out of, uh, out of different species of seaweed. So you can see in this picture here that the nest is behind it. And they can apparently use up to 10 different species of seaweed to make different parts of their nest. And then the, the females will come in and lay their eggs. Um, the males fertilize them and then um, and then sort of guard them, them for a bit until um, the, the babies hatch out. So again, really interesting and, and amazing behavioral insights that we've learned in the marine world. And, and Paul Naylor's done some amazing work on um, on blennies and to, to, to learn about their behavior and their, their individual um, identities, which is just brilliant. So yeah, that's the nest there. So we don't get, I wouldn't say we get a huge amount of um, sort of marine megafauna at Wembury um, in, ter in terms of the mammals. We were just having a conversation earlier in the evening that I always seem to miss um, when, when the dolphins are around. We do get the occasional seal, um, which is the, the grey seal, which are the most common seals down here. We do get the occasional ones. They, they often haul out, out on the mewstone, um, but they tend to prefer very quiet places, which, which Wembury isn't. Um, but we do occasionally see one just sort of bobbing around, hanging out, um, eating his fish leisurely, which is really lovely to see. But very, very common um, along the South Devon coast. I'm sure lots of you have seen grey seals around Brixham and, and Berryhead. So we're, we're lucky to have such a really good population down here in, in Devon and Cornwall. And then um, just to finish off with um, the, the mighty uh, basking shark which is the, the second largest um, shark in the world. I think it's just amazing that we get them just off our coastline, just off the Mewstone. There was one actually in Wembury Bay last year, last summer during lockdown, which I um, managed to miss. I'm very jealous that I missed it, but just, just incredible that we get them here. Um, you can see they, they spend most of their time on the surface with their mouths wide open, grazing all the little um, bits of plankton so sort of sucking them in filtering out the water and they go right the way up to uh, the west coast of Scotland I think so in the, the early summer they're down here and then they head on up following the plankton up to Scotland so really really um, you know lovely thing to see I'd love to see one I've only seen one from very far away down in uh, Land's End quite a few years ago but um, if, you, if you ever get out on boats then you might be, be lucky to see one this summer maybe next year. So <clears throat> that was um, really a sort of snapshot of, of some of the, you know, amazing uh, plants and animals which call the, the marine conservation area home. There, I suppose, the, the reason why it was designated a, a voluntary marine conservation area back in 1981, in recognition of just how diverse and, and amazing the site is, and also how important it has been, as I said at the start, for, for research and education. So. The marine conservation area exists um, from sort of Fort Bovisand to Gara Point, so it covers the, the mouth of the River Yelm and goes out beyond the Mewstone. It was, as, as it, you know, the voluntary indicates, it was a community initiative. So back in 1981, local community got together and decided um, that, that they wanted to do something about the, the conservation area. So this was before lots of the designations it has now which are our legal designations so um, there's there's lots of um, VMCAs around Cornwall there's one in Dorset and um, so we we've been part of this network um, since since 1981. And so this is the Marine Centre <clears throat> this is usually where I'm based uh, it's opened in in 1994 so 20, almost 27 years ago now this summer. It's been managed by us, by Devon Wildlife Trust for that whole time, but it's managed in a partnership with um, these, these other organisations here. So the National Trust own the land, they own the beach, the car park, um, they, they own the site that the centre's on. So that's, that's why Wembridge is not really considered a, a reserve, I suppose, because we don't actually own it. 
but it is it is a visitor center which we manage and we take the sort of leading role on um, so we also have Devon County Council and South Ham's District Council the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth so those are the, the main five funding partners and then we also have support from Wembridge, Wembury Parish Council and the Wembury Marine Conservation Area Advisory Group who, who, was, who set up the VMCA back in the 80s. So the next few slides are what, what we would usually do, I suppose, what we had been doing up until, up until last year. So the centre is usually staffed by uh, myself and my colleague Kat, who's um, our part-time Marine Awareness Officer. Kat's been at Wembury for um, the best part of, of 20 years, so I volunteered um, for Kat back in 2009. Um, so now we, we work alongside each other and um, between us usually cover seven days a week um, during the, the summer months when the centre is open. <clears throat> we have an amazing uh, range of volunteers. So um, I'm sure lots of you are aware of the, the volunteering that goes on within the Wildlife Trust, how grateful we are for our volunteers. We couldn't do sort of half of what we do without them. So we have a range from what we call full-time volunteers, so um, graduates looking for that experience to get into the job world, who would come and, and be with us sort of full-time over the summer months. We had uh, student placements, so internships from the university, for students to get that experience between their, their um, usually second and third year at university. We have our amazing sort of part-time volunteers, which I, I suppose is similar to, to the local group volunteering, a really a real mix of, of people from retired and um, people in the local community to, to students, to everything in between. Um, we offer work experience placements, Duke of Edinburgh volunteering. Um, we um, volunteer sort of young people with special educational needs. So a real variety, we try to offer opportunities to you know, as, as many people as we possibly can. And um, we really appreciate their support in helping us deliver everything that we do. So inside the centre um, is lots of information about the marine conservation area, about DWT, what we do, um, about the, all the amazing species and, and habitats that, that we have. It usually opens from the start of the Easter holidays until the end of September. So a, a good six month summer season. Um, we usually have around 20,000 visitors during that time, which, which is really a, a good number. Um, and so that's sort of one strand of what we do. The other strand is the public engagement. So again, during that, that season, we run lots of different types of events for the public, usually around 100 events um, per season. Our bread and butter is probably the Rockcall Safaris. Um, we also do um, beach combing, looking for mermaids purses and things, Easter egg case hunts, beach cleans, um, we do a national whale and dolphin watch um, and for the past uh, four or five years we've been running snorkel safaris as well. So lots of different um, activities for members of the public, things like holiday clubs we started doing in the last few years, birthday parties, private um, groups, anything and everything really, if we've got the, the time and the tide to do it. And the third strand of our work is our schools education. So this is a really important part of what we do. Um, it's part of my role is to, to sort of deliver and develop our marine education officer, our offer. So we work with around 50 schools um, every year, a mixture of we go into schools and, and give them a talk before they come out to the beach and we go rock pooling with them. So it's two sort of opportunities to, to work with the same children and embed our, our marine conservation messages. Um, and we usually work with around three and a half thousand school children every year, which is, which is brilliant. And then uh, other community events. So things like going to fairs and shows, um, doing brownie and cub groups, um, delivering talks like this, we had a brilliant bio blitz back in uh, 20, 2019. Um, so lots of different types of, of community events as well. And we're really um, important part of the community in, in Wembury as well. And we, we acknowledge that and work hard to look after it. So that was kind of um, a, a whistle stop tour of what a normal year would be like for us. Um, and then obviously we, we'd planned the same again last year. Um, and then, of course, COVID-19 hit and that sort of blew everything out of the water, really. 
Um, we didn't open the centre at all. We didn't run any um, public events in person. Um, so I'm just going to sort of run through uh, what, what we did instead, basically. It was, um, it was quite a tricky year. Um, colleague Kat was on was on furlough for, for quite a lot of that time. I was um, had sh had short periods on furlough, but um, we still managed, I think, to to achieve quite a lot despite the, the difficulties um, facing the centre and the Wildlife Trust. So one of the things we've managed to do uh, with some funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, and from some other um, smaller pots as well is to upgrade the centre. So this is. Um, been sort of in, it's been in need of a refresh. The last one was in 2006, so it's given us a really good opportunity to look at all of the information that's inside the centre um, and completely redo it. Really, uh, so this is this is ongoing. Hopefully, it's going to be finished in the next few months. We've been spending a lot of time um, discussing and deciding on the information and what's going to go where, um, and it's it's going to be really exciting. I think for for when we open, hopefully, hopefully in the summer. So that, that's been really good. Um, we've been developing a new website, which we're hoping to launch in the next few months. This um, came with a Lottery Community Fund, which also funded our BioBlitz back in 2019. So it's going to be a new and improved uh, website um, with all of our information and uh, events and everything like that, school and group booking. So hopefully we're going to launch that in the next few months um, when we've got some events to put on it. So we're just holding fire on that for now. Uh, we've also been able to um, re redo our seashore code. So we've got some new graphics done for our seashore code and a reprint of our, our rocky shore guide, which is really lovely um, sort of splash proof guide to take rock pooling, um, which uh, I've said to Simon, I'm happy to, to send you the links to those. If you do do your own self-guided rock pooling this summer, then it's really important to follow the seashore code um, and, and this guide shows lots of the, the species that I've just talked about. So I spent a lot of my time in the first part of lockdown last year um, trying to develop our, our sort of online resource office, so all of the education that we do, trying to turn that into online resources, which is something we've wanted to do for a long time. So it gave us a really good opportunity to, um, to be able to do that. And they're, they're now on the DWT website in the Wild Learning at Home section. So these are resources for, for schools, for families for, for anyone really on, um, on different themes to do with the seashore and seaweed um, and, and estuaries and how we can look after them. So we had some funding from Southwest Water to do that, uh, which was great. And um, Paul and, and his wife, Teresa Naylor, um, also made us some really wonderful short films of, um, of Wembury Bay, but also of our, our sort of rock pool safari. So we managed to turn our school talk into a, a film to send out to schools which has been really, really useful. So if you head to our, our YouTube page, it's just Wembury Marine Centre, you can see them on there. Um, and some really, really stunning footage that, that Paul's taken, which is it's just lovely. Another part of my role is to um, support our, our conservation manager with uh, marine advocacy. So we, um, we respond to things like the, the fisheries consultations. Um, we were campaigning last year um, for, for highly protected marine areas. So this is something new that we hope um, might, might come to Devon. Hopefully we might get a highly protected marine area in one of our already existing marine protected areas. And um, these would effectively be no take zones. So really, really actually protect the marine wildlife, which, which not all of our marine protected areas are doing at the moment. So that's something quite exciting, which we're asking people to get behind. So if you're if you feel inclined to, to support that designation in, in Devon, then um, just head to the Wildlife Trusts page and take a look there. And one of the things which um, was quite alarming for me to, to learn about a few years ago was um, the fact that otters are drowning in um, prawn and eel traps in our, in our estuaries and, and coastal waters. So we're hoping to do some awareness around this issue. And this is something that can be really easily avoided by um, using otter guards at the entrance to these traps. Um, so, so it means that the otters can't come in and then get stuck. So something really, really important that we're hoping to um, produce some leaflets and some awareness um, later on this year. Okay, so 
that's pretty much where we're up to now. Obviously, um, things are things are looking brighter this year, which is brilliant. The vaccines are going well, and it looks like things might open up. So, in terms of what um, what the future holds, I've been doing sort of online virtual talks, school talks for the past year. These these um, may continue until uh, until we can you know see schools and, and people in person. We may have some school visits later in the summer term before the summer holidays. It, it just depends on, on what's decided and, and how things go. We'll be running our education program, Marine Wildlife Champions, in the coming year, which works with a school, a small number of schools to take on um, challenges to try and help um, protect marine wildlife by, you know, behaviour change, things like plastic and climate change. Um, hopefully we will be opening the centre this season. We're not sure exactly when yet. It, it won't be the Easter holidays, which I think probably a few months ago we might have hoped for. Um, but certainly it will hopefully be open by the summer holidays. So after June the, the 21st, um, if everything goes well, then I'm, I'm hopeful that we will open the centre and, and be able to hold some events. But exactly how they'll, how they'll run and what they'll, they'll look like, we will be deciding in the next few weeks. And um, just the last one really about, about the Wildlife Trust. So lots of you may know that we've committed to reducing our carbon footprint by 50% by 2025 um, and by 100% by uh, 2030. So this is um, a sort of a big, a big chunk of our, our colleagues work to, to try and achieve this, which we'll, we will all feed into. But I think it's really exciting um, and I'm really pleased that we've committed to doing this. So I hope Hope we'll be able to achieve this. Um, so yeah, I think we just have to kind of wait and see, but hopefully we'll be back to normal. Um, if not this year, then then certainly next year. So I think that's um, that's everything that I uh, I wanted to say this evening. Um, thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm happy to take any questions if you've got any. I'll uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Hi. Hi, Coral. I've got a few questions. It's John here, John White. I've got a few questions that have come through. The first one is from me. Um, is the cold water coral endangered in a similar way to warm water corals or is it in a different uh, place? So, um, coral, well, the, the pink sea fan that I showed is quite a rare um corals so it is it is endangered in that sense it's it's not as common as it used to be in terms of um climate change and ocean warming i i don't think it has the the same um impact as it will on on tropical um on, on tropical species of corals who who really can only tolerate well they can't tolerate you know much more of an increase in water temperature um but i'm not i'm not 100% sure obviously um, ocean warming will affect our, our cold water corals um, as it's affecting lots of other species but I don't think it will be um, in the same way and at the same rate as it's already affecting you know 50% of, of the tropical corals yeah. on the planet. The, uh, uh, do you know how much the water's warming around Wembry over the last uh, uh, couple of decades? No, I, I don't, I'm afraid, um, but the, I know that Plymouth Coastal Observatory, who are just around the corner, um, would, would probably know that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it's, um, it's changed that much, but I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out. Okay, uh, right. PF, um, uh, uh, causes for population changes. Um, uh, to, do you know what they are? It's mentioned a number of population changes, uh, mostly decreases. Uh, do you know what the likely causes are? Yeah, so um, so climate changes potentially is, is one of those causes. So um, there, are, there are lots of, of sort of colder water species that are, are declining, that are moving um, further, further north. But things like the cushion star, which uh, prefer, you know, slightly warmer waters, so from further down in, in Europe, um, are becoming more common. So we are finding more um, species that, that prefer warmer waters. Yeah. I think yeah. things like um, we, we don't get them 
very often at Wembury, certainly not alive, but you know, trigger fish will um, probably become more common um, in our waters. So, so climate change is one of the causes, of course, um, you know, fishing and overfishing causes population changes. So um, there's, you know, it's possible that the, the edible crab, for example, is, is currently being, you know, overfished um, slightly and, and it can't naturally replace itself quick enough. Um, but when I, when I mentioned that earlier, I didn't mention it's, it sort of coincided with an increase in another species of crab, which is um, the furrowed crab. And again, the, the evidence so far is, is mainly anecdotal, but it's possible that, that this furrowed crab out, out competes the edible crab now, or you know, it's been able to do that because of the fishing has had an impact on the edible crab. Mm. Um, and then there are, there are annual changes in, in the sort of larval recruitment of, of species. So when we talked about the, the dog whelks, back in the 80s and when we think about plankton and things, the, the, the way larvae is moved around and, and settles in different places um, can be affected by, by lots of different things, which um, I don't know the answers to. But so, so there, there are lots of different things and it's, it's a mixture of sort of direct human impact and, and natural um, competition and, and climate change, of course, is, is only going to continue to have probably you know more of an impact as, as we move forward yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Margaret Harlan said um, if all cushion stars become male at the age of two what are they before that <laughs> they're hermaphrodites basically so so neither right or, or both both <laughs> neither or both it is, it is confusing <laughs> I, th I think it's neither. I don't think they have either either organs. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's, it's either either or both. Okay. Good question. <laughs> Simon says, um, "How is cuttlefish uh, colour change controlled? Uh, prompted? How does that work?" So um, they have thousands of uh, what's called chromatophores. So those are, are sort of light sensing cells um, that, that are, are controlled through a sort of central nervous system. So they, the, the messages are sort of instant um, and, and very reactive based on, on what's going on around, what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. so, so chromatophore cells in, in, their, in their skin and in their flesh. Um, that, that can be sort of changed instantly. Amazing. Um, here's another one from Simon. Local fishermen report massive drop in uh, edible crab populations. Um, any idea why this is? Well, I, I think I sort of alluded to that on it before. before. Um, I, th I think it's a, a combination of probably all of those things. So, you know, it has been heavily impacted as, as a fishery. Um, perhaps um, there, are, there are catch sizes for them already and perhaps those need to be looked at. Um, you know, you're not, not allowed to take um, buried crabs, so crabs that are carrying eggs and they need to be a minimum size already. So I, I think it's perhaps a case of, you know, they're not having enough time to recover, but these other impacts are probably affecting them as well. So perhaps this competition um, and, and other wider environmental impacts as well. But I couldn't, I couldn't answer for certain, I'm afraid. Those are just sort of best guesses, but there, there will be others doing, doing research on that. Do you get spider crabs at Wembury? Yes. You do? Yeah, so yeah, spider crabs are quite common at Wembury on the, uh, on the lower shore and the, the shallow reef. So we see them quite commonly snorkeling and we see probably one or two rock falling each year as well and on a really good low spring tide. Um, so yeah, good, good spot for them. Uh -huh. Um, do you uh, feel boat anchoring and anti-fouling affect the marine life at all? Yes, definitely. So boat anchoring is one of the main um, causes of seagrass damage. So that, that's, there's a lot going on um, on that at the moment. It's quite a hot topic, but, but basically uh, anchoring in, in seagrass um, can, can really um, disperse, you know, creates a, a big hole in the sort of middle yeah. of, of the meadow basically and as it moves around it scrapes around the seagrass so that has a big impact. 
anti-fouling can as well. It's obviously using using chemicals to um, to clean the uh, to put on the you know the hulls of, of boats and things. So if that if that gets into the water, it can have an impact. Um, and there's there's also lots of um, issues with invasive species and, and anti-fouling and things like that. So it's it's quite a complicated one. And it's not just as easy as um, not using anti-fouling. Right. But yeah, both of those things can can cause damage. Um, there there are organisations working on advanced mooring systems for boats. So um, so instead of everyone anchoring, they they tie themselves up to it to one mooring yeah. which has an anchor at the bottom. Um, and yeah, and I imagine you know wherever an anchor is put, unless it's on you know bare sand, it will have an impact. So if it's put down on a rocky reef, it will have an impact on on everything living there as well. So. It's, it's good to check where you're anchoring. Um, is Wembury Bay meant to be one of the protected marine sites uh, that this government promised but has not actioned? If so, uh, can it be, what can be done to help gain this uh, protection? Okay, uh, good question. So Wembury um, lies within the Plymouth Sound and Estuary Special Area of Conservation, which is um, European level conservation uh, co uh, designation. So that's, in theory, one of the most highly protected um, sites that, that a marine area can have. So it has numerous designations already. So it wasn't put forward for the, um, the Marine Conservation Zone designations that have been going on for the past 10 years but it it's potentially could be put forward as a site for this highly protected marine area um which i, I mentioned earlier mm. but there are there are lots of other you know variables that have to be met in order for a site to be um applicable to do it so it, it a highly protected marine area would really need to be somewhere that's that's relatively pristine and that, that it would work to, to basically remove any impact. So even things like anchoring could potentially not be allowed in that area. So um, as much as I'd love it to become a, a highly protected marine area, it's, it's not as simple as that. But one thing that you can do to, to support it is to, um, to, to click on that link that I sent earlier. So if, if you Google HBMAs and wildlife trusts, you can, you can support the campaign for the government to designate them. So they, they will be designating hopefully a small number in the next few years. Um, but, you know, and we'd love to, we'd love to get one in Devon. Um, so it will, you know, like lots of these, these campaigns, public support is, is vitally important. And that's what got us the, the marine conservation zones. Devon, in the first round, Devon had the, the highest number of responses of all the county um, wildlife trusts, which was brilliant. And we've got 15 marine conservation zones as a result of that. So mm. that's, it's, it's brilliant. Okay. Uh, there was talk a while ago that uh, DWT wanted to create a mobile marine centre for the rest of Devon's coast. Um, is that still a, an ambition for DWT? Um, I'm, I'm not sure of that one. I, ha I haven't personally heard of a, a mobile marine centre. Um, we certainly want to expand our, our marine work, you know, beyond Wembury. We have um, Seaton Jurassic in, in East Devon and, you know, there's, there's potential for um, more to be done in North Devon. We've acquired Horsey Island. There's hopefully going to be um, some sort of visitor centre there potentially. So, it's certainly an ambition of the trust and an ambition of mine to to, to broaden our presence um, throughout the county. We we you know we engage people throughout the county, but in terms of having actual actual sites to use, um, you know, it would be great to be able to expand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do international paints still run anti-fouling test beds in the Yelm? Um, if so, should they not be stopped? <clears throat> I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. The, the person who would know is probably Nigel Mortimer from South Devon AOMB. I haven't heard of them doing that, so that, that doesn't mean they're not, because uh, often things go on under your nose that you don't know about, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I don't think so. 
but Nigel would know and, and I can I can find out as well. Okay, okay, that would be interesting. Um, and from Anne Sato, just a comment. It's an amazing thought when you look out to, uh, at the, to the sea and then think of the life forms underneath it, um, getting on with their lives that we can't see, um, as in your first <clears throat> your first photograph there. Yeah, yeah. And she yeah said, I think I think it's it's amazing as well. And the the more I you know do do this job, I still have huge amounts to learn. And the more the, you know these tiny little organisms that you think literally just sit there just have fascinating lives and they're they're just it's just amazing to to learn about them and um it, you know it's really it's really good fun and it's just lovely knowing that that they're all out there they're all really important um and we, we can get lots from them and when paul naylor gave us his talk i couldn't get over the the vividness the the uh, the intensity of the colors you know it's rivals uh, tropical coral reefs so. yeah definitely and that, that's a big part of what you know Paul and I and and many others try to do is to show people that you know we have all of those Attenborough worthy species and habitats right here in in the UK and right here in Devon and um you know we just need to to get out and see it and and appreciate it a bit more yeah great thanks Coral back to you Simon Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carl. That was excellent. Really very enjoyable, very informative, and amazing pictures, as John said. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks and uh, we, we look forward to you managing to open the centre and, and, and maybe we could come and visit you down down at Wembury um, with a group of uh, people in, maybe in the summer or the next year or whenever. But uh, we'd very much like to do that. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Coral has offered to send us some guides to Wembury so you can do some self-guided visits there in the summer anyway. So we'll try and um, sort out uh, links to those for you um, in the newsletter um, and uh, Carol's kindly agreed also that this talk has been recorded so if you have any friends who um, would have missed this but want to catch up then I will send you the link to the DWT YouTube channel as, uh, channel as before um, and you'll be able to um, recap and, and, and catch up so anyway thank you so much Carol um, much appreciated and uh, um, uh, I just to advise everybody that next uh, month's talk on climate change by Vicky um, Pope will be on the 20th of April. Um, I'll send you uh, the links to the uh, Eventbrite page for that um, uh, as soon as I can get that sorted out. Um, if there are any questions, don't forget to use the Bubby Tracy LG at DevonWildlifeTrust.org email address. Um, we have been having the odd hiccup with the distribution list for the newsletter and I'm in the process of trying to validate our, our mailing list for people receiving that newsletter. The problem of course with trying to do that is that the very people you want to identify who no longer want to receive the newsletter don't actually answer their emails so uh, we're trying to work with with our, our providers to sort that out so bear with us and, and uh, it may be we come through with some mechanisms to try and revalidate your your sign up for the newsletter to try and make sure that everybody does get gets the messages on time so so leave that with us anyway thank you very much and and see you all next time thank you thank you very much carol thank you <laughs> there we go well done excellent Brilliant. So now we just need to end it for all, I think. Bye, everyone.